So uh, what I've been asked to speak about is what the landscape for cyber looks like at the Rhode Island State Police. So that's where I'll start and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So let me see if I can share my screen correctly and get PowerPoint up. All right, it's a good start. All right, so in, in Rhode Island, because we're a small state, we're fortunate enough to have the State Police house the computer crimes unit where we have all our members and our task force members in one office. We're basically split into three different figures within the state police computer crimes unit. And we're all cross designated in, in each discipline. But the first discipline we deal with is the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Uh, you can see we, we have a healthy amount of uh, members assigned to that task force. And we're basically um, tasked with child exploitation investigations throughout the internet that have a nexus to Rhode Island. Another part of the computer crimes unit is the Joint Cyber Task Force, which was established in 2009. This is a, a unique entity because it's a public-private partnership that's designed to address the cyber incident response and information sharing across Rhode Island. We also conduct outreach, uh, invest, excuse me, outreach to schools and communities, such as the Cyber Patriot, the Tech Collective. We also do presentations uh, such as these. We're really about within the Joint Cyber Task Force about information sharing. And leading into that is the, the Rhode Island Fusion Center, which is part of the Joint Cyber Task Force. And that was established back in 2001, basically on the crux of what happened on September 11th, 2001. The, the United States realized they weren't information sharing well, therefore fusion centers were created, allow for information sharing and um, clearing houses for information from terrorists to cyber events to anything that has a national or local interest. And lastly, within the computer crimes unit, we also have the computer crimes forensic laboratory, which is uh, housed by two civilian forensic analysts that are essentially the backbone to our unit. So what does the Joint Cyber Task Force look like? So it was, this, again, established in 2009, but really didn't take hold until the, uh, the Governor's Cybersecurity Commission met in 2015 and established our protocols, along with the presidential directive of that same year. And within that directive, uh, the Rhode Island Emergency Management Agency is in charge of having all the incident plans put in place, and they're basically the, uh, the figurehead for all the uh, incident plans within Rhode Island, one of them being the Cybersecurity Incident Response Plan. And as you can see here, you know, we, um, REMA gets their lawful authority from a direct state statute. So the JCTF um, currently has approximately 230 members and 123 businesses, which spans the the globe from law enforcement, military, private sector, universities, public sector. Um, we really are a, a good mix of public and private sector, which helps bring a lot of the technical expertise that we may not have at the state police to any type of investigation in regards to an infrastructure uh, situation. So part of our outreach program, like I said earlier, we help support the Cyber Patriot, um, which is a national youth cyber education program. It's important to get our youth involved in cyber because as we know today, cyber, is a cyber hygiene and cyber protecting our cyber infrastructure is very important. So if we can get the youth of America to be interested in cyber to only help bolster our plan in the future. One of our other initiatives was there was a 211 service that anyone could call for various information that would be needed. We put a cyber aspect to that so now 211 has trained operators who, if a victim is a, or a caller is a victim of a cyber scam, they may not know where to go. Um, if they dial 211 and advise they have a, a cyber, they're a cyber victim, the call takers can direct them in, to different websites, which will help them understand how to better have a cyber posture, how not the do's and the don'ts. And also how to help resolve any identity theft issue that may come about due to the scam, whether it's to contact the local police department to have a report filed and investigated, to contact the credit bureaus to make sure that there's a flag put on the report. So they're kind of our frontline operators as far as um, individuals who are scammed in Rhode Island. These are individual victims, not businesses, but 
individuals who, who may have fallen uh, victim. Additionally, with the Joint Cyber Task Force, uh, we hold quarterly meetings. Now, this was pre-COVID. Um, COVID's kind of changed the way we hold our meetings, and we've suspended them temporarily so we can figure out a good path for the meetings. But these worked out very well. It allowed our members and our business partners to come together to information share. And we also had at least one guest speaker who talked about some industry-specific issues that they were seeing um, at their workplace. That, that worked out very well for us and it was a good way for others within the community to network. So hopefully um, post pandemic, we'll be bringing that back. So with the Joint Cyber Task Force, we're always looking for different initiatives and different grants that can be used to help bolster the cyber posture of Rhode Island. We're fortunate enough to uh, be awarded a, a grant from the State Homeland Security Program, which this one in itself was for law enforcement departments and it provided uh, three different aspects that we could give to local departments who may not be able to afford it because of the budget concerns. The first one being the cybersecurity end user training, which is globally recognized as an important training that get your end users up to speed on, on their cyber posture. We utilize Wombat platform to do this and the cities and towns can schedule their own cyber training or we can schedule them from the joint cyber task force that have their uh, push down to their employees to make sure they're cyber aware, not to click on links and um, not to fall for scams, or at least be able to better recognize if, if an email is a phishing email versus a legitimate email from a company. Included uh, with that are phishing exercises where we use here at the state police and at the local level as well, where we'll send out uh, phishing emails to determine if, if our employees are being aware of, of what's coming across their email account versus just clicking and opening every email that they see. Uh, what I can say is we've been doing this for over two years now, and we've seen a tremendous decrease in the click rate of emails, which is good. We're not at a perfect level yet, and our ultimate goal is to get a zero click rate when it comes to the phishing emails. Um, report, you know, we're not there yet, but we're trending in the right direction. I heard uh, Mark, the, the previous presenter, talk about uh, vulnerability scans. We're fortunate enough with that grant to be able to purchase uh, Tenable along with the, uh, the add-on Lumen. And we're not endorsing the product, we're just letting you know what we're doing within the JCTF to, to help, again, bolden the cyber, struck, uh, the cyber posture of the local police departments along with the state police. So this is a vulnerability scanner which is, works well. We can provide that to the local IT to make sure the fire department and police departments are utilizing this within their networks. It's just another tool in the tool belt that the Joint Cyber Task Force tries to provide to the, uh, to the municipalities within Rhode Island. Um, if, if you're not presently a member, and, and this sounds interesting to either you individually or to your company, all you'll need to do is navigate to that website. If it's too long of a website to, to write down, just go to the state police website and then you can just click on the Joint Cyber Task Force uh, link, and it'll bring you to a page which includes this bottom cutout. All you do is just click on the partnership form. It'll ask for some information to be sent to our grant manager. She'll log the information and then reach out to you and how to properly uh, register with the, with the Joint Cyber Task Force. If your company's not there already, I encourage you to do so. If anything, you'll, you'll be part of our um, outreach program and we, we may be able to provide you information that you're not hearing about uh, within the cyber world. One of the, uh, the federal agencies or the federal uh, partnerships that we utilize is called the Multi-State Information Sharing and Analyst Center, MSISAC for short. So basically you can see their mission there is to, to assist the cybersecurity posture of state, local, tribal, and territorial governments. So if you are associated with the municipality, um, you are allowed to, to join that information sharing group. Uh, they, they're a tremendous organization. Uh, we utilize them all the time. And I cut out just a few of their um, services with their membership, but uh, most importantly, they do a lot of information sharing. They help out with uh, cyber incident responses. You can use their uh, tabletop exercises, for example, with the Board of Elections, we just had a tabletop exercise a few weeks ago and it was taken right from MSISEC's website. If you're a private entity and you have an association with 
um, a municipal entity, whether that's a local, tribal, territorial, or with the state, you can actually become a member of the JCTF as well. You'll need to be sponsored through the, the uh, entity that you're associated with. So for example, if you're in the town of, um, town of Charlestown and you're contracted to do their IT work, you can become a member of the MSI SEC and they will provide you with all the tools that they have available. Um, the only thing you would have to do is get be sponsored through that town so MSI SEC can confirm that you, you are indeed associated with that town. Um, you can go to their website. Um, you can kind of look around, click around, see what they have to offer to see if it's something that interests the, or you or your company. But I highly suggest um, at least looking. They have a lot of good information on their website. They provide a lot of really good services if you can become a member. For example, one of their services is malware protection. So this, they have two different types of softwares they provide free of charge depending on your, if you're a public entity or private entity. Um, one, the non-government entity is called Quad9 and the government entity is called malicious domain blocking. So basically they're blocking malicious domains that may have been navigated by accident or on purpose by one of your end users. Again, it's a free tool. Um, if, you, if your company doesn't already have something like this or if your town doesn't already have something like this, MSIC, ISAC offers that free of charge. So not a lot of things that are free out there today, so I suggest taking advantage of what they have to offer. So what does the, um, the landscape look like in Rhode Island for cyber? And it doesn't look any different than any other state in the country. So we could probably spend a whole day on talking about what we see in Rhode Island, what we see across the US. I picked just a few just to kind of touch upon. Ransomware is always a big deal. Uh, the CEO fraud, it's been around for a while but it's, it's still rearing its ugly head on a daily basis. So I thought it'd be a good idea to talk about that as well. And the last thing is the mobile, the mobile threats. Now that we have a lot of employees teleworking from home, utilizing maybe a home laptop, but a company cell phone or vice versa, uh, mobile threats are, are an issue these days. So, First thing I wanted to talk about is malware. It's, it's been around for a while and it's caused heartache for a lot of different you know, IT personnel. Uh, we've seen a recent trend now with the maze ransomware. Yes, it will lock up your system and encrypt your system, but now the bad actors are trying to figure out, all right, if we're not getting payment as often as we would like, how can we ramp up the chance of getting a, a payment through Bitcoin or whatever the ransom is? So now they're, they're starting to exfiltrate some data from your system. Maze Ransomware has done that. So this is just something I wanted to put out there for individuals to be aware. If you're not already aware, there is a possibility of your data being encrypted along with some of the data being exfiltrated as well with the thought process by the bad actors. If you don't pay, we will publicly embarrass your company by providing data that we've retrieved from your servers. And I put this next screen up just, just as a reminder, as no one ever wants to see this screen. And we've, we've gotten many calls from IT departments, from corporations, large and small, and mom and pop shops to say, what do I do now? And if we always go down the checklist. It's, we can't do a lot for you now, but what were you doing before that to maybe recover? So I put this up on the screen because it's a little uh, ominous for uh, anyone in the IT world to see. <clears throat> And like I said, with the maze ransomware, uh, they are exfiltrating data now, not only encrypting your servers and all the data on your servers and any, any path that they can take, they are, they are exfiltrating it. You see Canon along with, there's a school out in Nevada who had, I believe the student population somewhere around 300,000 and a lot of their data was encrypted and portions of it were exfiltrated. So this is a real issue. I put the other screen up for the FBI. The FBI says, and along with the state police, we take the same posture. Don't pay the ransom where it demands because it only encourages the cyber criminals to target others and to continue their bad acts. We do understand that you have a, you being a private corporation, are responsible to other individuals and responsible to your insurers if you have them for cyber insurance. So that's our posture is, we don't encourage anyone to pay, but we do understand that you have other 
other board members, you have insurance companies that you have to adhere to, and they may have a different um, opinion on whether or not you should pay to get your data back. If you get it back at all, because there's no guarantee that if you pay that ransom that you're getting your encryption key to unlock your data, and there's no guarantee that there's not another malware sitting on your server that you just encrypted that's gonna activate again in six months and the individuals, the bad actors are gonna ask for another amount of money to get that encryption key. So that, that's the state police's posture is, is not to pay the ransom, but we understand that you, you being the corp, private corporations um, answer to different individuals. So I said they talk about the business email compromise uh, because we do still see that a lot. And I think these are one of the cyber crimes that it's easier to try and filter out if you have your end users alert for what to look out for. Some of the cyber, cyber crimes, it's very technical to try and defend. Um, this one is, a, depending on the path of the business email compromise, I think this one may be a little easier to defend. So just to quickly go through it, so the, the bad actor either gains access to your, your mail, which is bad, or they're able to spoof your domain and trick someone in a position of trust to wire money. It goes in many different paths, but basically they're either in your network, sending emails on behalf of an employee who may be a controller, or maybe your CFO, CEO, sending an email to your controller or to your bills payable, say, I need this done quickly. There's always a sense of urgency with the emails. I need you to wire X amount of dollars to this account. The problem when you start wiring money, the banks see that as a cash transaction, unless both in each wire participant says, all right, this was done in error, send the money back. The banks typically do not send the money back because the bad actor is never gonna say, all right, I scammed this company, send the money back. So just to kind of play that out, um, talk in general about investigation. We had worked here at the state police and all the names were taken out of this, uh, this PowerPoint presentation, but it gives a general understanding of how this operation works and how fruitful it can be for the bad actors. So being an ocean state, you're gonna have a lot of boat transactions. So we have boat brokers who work with the buyer and the seller of a boat. This one, for this case, it was a $306,000 boat. What they did was the seller, the, the seller and the buyer had a common broker Broker's in charge of brokering the deal, sending the money, and then developing the documents. This broker hired a marine docu documentation firm to coordinate all the documentation transfer for the boat sale from the seller to the buyer. The boat brokerage firm receives an email they believed was from the seller identifying a new account for the wire transfer. So boat broker receives an email from who they believe is a seller at that $306,000 well, we want you, when you get that money from the buyer, we want you to wire the money to this account. This is a new account. The new account had the same name as the bank and the wire account had the same name as the, the seller. Excuse me, yes, as the seller. But the problem is it was a new routing number, a new account number provided. The brokerage firm did not pick up the phone, did not reach out to the seller to say, are you sure you want to transfer this money? So the, the brokerage firm then wires the money, $306,000 to this new account that's been identified via email. No one says anything. Everyone thinks, oh, it's just another, another sale of a boat in Rhode Island. We're all set. Three days later, the seller reaches out to the broker. I haven't received my money yet. The broker then informs the seller, we wired that money three days ago to the account that you specified. Now they start looking at their emails and they realized there was a mistake on behalf of the, the brokerage firm, which they thought was in the, the correct wire transfer. So like I said earlier, the, the problem with wire transfers are the banks see these wire transfers as cash. The only way you get the money back for the most part is, is there's an exception to every rule, but for the most part, the seller, or excuse me, the both parties at the end of the wire transfer have to agree that money was wired incorrectly. Other than that, 
the money's gone and you can't get it back. So a couple lessons learned that they learned the hard way. If you have the opportunity, this is a little more in the weeds, this first um, note. But if you do have the opportunity, you have a concern about the email, the way it came through, that it just doesn't seem right, reach out to the other person that purportedly sent that email. Find out if they sent it. Did you actually ask me to change this wire? <clears throat> for this one, um, if you're able to look at your email headers, which we did for the case, the email header geolocated to Nigeria. Should have been an immediate red flag. That being said, not everyone is knows how to, to look at an email header. But everyone can pick up a phone to say, all right, this individual just changed the wire on me right before I send the money out. You might wanna see that as a red flag. Does anything within the email look suspicious? Are there any misspellings? Is the way, the way they're communicating now different than the way they've been communicating in the past? So we try to train individuals to, to just be curious about the email, look at it, especially when you're wiring large amounts of money or if a CEO erratically sends you an email saying, I need you to wire this money now, has a CEO ever done this before? Start to think to yourself from, from the end user standpoint, is this out of the norm? If it is, pause and go through your chain of command. However, you, you get in contact with your CEO and confirm that this wire transfer is, le transfer is legitimate. So just a couple variations. Like I said, um, at the beginning of this, um, case study, there are a couple different ways that we've figured out that it happens. So if your account is hacked through a spare phishing campaign or some other way, if the bad guys are in your email account watching emails come through, you know, that, that's a different scenario. That's, that's a lot harder to detect than if it's a spoofed email where they're making the email look similar to, but not exact um, from the CEO or from this case from the, from the seller. So in this case, you can see there's no second E in the word Kelly. If at quick glance, they look like the same email, but they're not. Same if you're spoofing the domain. In the law firm example, law firm is spelled correctly on the left-hand side, but law firm where the I should be is an L. Again, a quick glance, it looks legitimate, and, and off, off they go. The other way is to just kind of browse the, if, if the email has a name associated with it, Browse the cursor over the email name and the true email will pop up. And then you can see if it's a lot of numbers and letters with the domain you're not familiar with. That's an easy indication that this is a, a spoofed email. This is some spare phishing campaign and I should delete the email. Or if you have a report phishing button on your email container, select the email, hit the button and let, let that email be captured and further analyzed by your IT professionals. So mobile threats, mobile threats are, are a legitimate threat. Uh, I'm sure everyone has seen the, the, the smishing campaigns now. Uh, I'm, I myself has, have received multiple text messages indicating that I have a package waiting for me at FedEx, UPS, has been waiting there for a while. I'll click this link and enter in some personal information so my package can be properly delivered. That's obviously a problem. You know, as far as I know, UPS and FedEx doesn't operate that way and they would never ask for personal information in regards to a package. So a lot of times it's just having the individual step back and think about, does it seem like a legitimate text? And this comes into play now again, because we're, a lot of people are teleworking. Teleworking's great. You, you're able to stay home and, and, and do your work and now you're on your home Wi-Fi or you're VPNing into your company but you gotta worry about what your employees are plugging into their laptops, to their desktops, to their phones. Are they gonna infect your network by accessing a, a site they're not supposed to access because they're at the easier comfort of their house? Or do they fall victim to a smishing campaign on their phone and now, now it's you know, running its course through the laptop and potentially to your network? So, just to kind of wrap this up, we talked about the text messages through the, the, the parcel packages. It's the same thing through bank fraud, reward text, and now they're using COVID as a way to try and either spare fish or get you to click on a link that's not accurate, that's malicious, and will do something bad either to your phone 
to your computer that's hooked up potentially to your business network. And I'll just wrap up the presentation quickly. These aren't, um, these aren't probably aren't any suggestions you haven't already seen considering the profession that I'm talking to, but we think it's important just to re to reinforce the, the do's and don'ts or more the do's as a, to protecting your network. Install patches, that's probably the, the best thing you can do to help protect your network is install patches and updates. Employ two-factor authentication. Create that secondary layer of security for you and your employees. Limit control access, the principles of least privilege. Should my end user who does pick, pick any job, should they have admin access to their desktop? Most likely not. So if they don't have admin access, now they're not such a threat on your network. Uh, configure your critical operating system parameters, acceptable use policy, password policy. I know Mark just talked about that. It's an important aspect. End user training. Again, here at the State Police, we use Wombat. For us, it works. I'm not endorsing Wombat, but I'm endorsing using some type of endpoint user training. We get a lot of feedback from our troopers. They, they get tired of taking these exams, watching videos, but it's an important part of being cyber aware and it's potentially stopped us from you know, suffering some type of cyber attack. And then it's about changing the culture. Every employee has to be on board. It only takes one employee to just to click away at every email that they receive and then it could infect your network. So it needs to be a complete cultural embracement by your employees. We've been talking about segregating your networks since malware has been a thing. It's important to keep your backups and separate them offsite if you can, but most importantly, you got to test your backups. It's great to do, to keep, you know, your, your backups air gapped, but if they're not being tested and you need them for some reason and they're no good, then, then it doesn't really leave you in a comfortable spot. And last but not least, I'll jump back on the MSI SEC bandwagon, JCTF. Um, the two programs that are, are very important in, in Rhode Island, uh, JCTF is, is run by the state police, but MSI SEC is a great federal partnership where they have lots of tools in their tool belt that they can help provide you, especially for the smaller companies that may not have a full-time IT staff. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions. I'll leave my information here up on the board if anyone needs to get a hold of me. The phone number is the general line to our computer crimes unit. Um, that rings at every desk, so that's the best opportunity that you'll get to talk to a live person. If you want to uh, email me, feel free. That's my email address there. Awesome, Corporal Mercera, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, if any of the attendees have any questions, please make sure you put those into the uh, Q&A section at the bottom here. We do have uh, one question that's in here that I'll go ahead and, uh, and share here. So the question is, what are the best tools and other resources to protect my personal life, specifically uh, kids now that they are doing remote learning and a lot more computer activities and when older to protect from their own use? Any tips you can share? So you, any, you could basically Google any, you could Google that in particular and you'll come up with a thousand different types of software. Um, my suggestion in being a father is to check your, your, your children's phones, laptops, any digital devices. And I, I don't want this to sound simple, but be a parent. I wouldn't allow my, parent, my children to go out, hang out with someone that I don't know. I don't know their parents. I don't know their children. It kind of goes the same with the internet. You got to be careful. Kids go down that rabbit hole innocently a lot of times and that's where they end up running into trouble and you know we come in to, to try and help the situation and find out what happened so as far as software I wouldn't say I have anything in particular because from our position with the state police I don't like to recommend any type of software in particular but what I would say is to constantly talk to your children about the internet the dangers and the good aspects of the internet I don't want to say that you need to to make sure that they know the dangers of the internet, but understand that the gravity of what can happen out there. And there are individuals out there that have bad intentions and they can portray themselves as any age, any demographic. They can morph themselves into anybody they see fit to help gain the trust of your children. So my principle is 
always talk to your children about the danger of the internet, what it can do for you, the good things and the bad things to be careful so they don't find themselves in, in a difficult situation or if they see it trending in that way, they know there's an open line of communication between the children and the parent and you know, hopefully stop something that bad that might have happened.